Hey folks, my name is Nathan Johnston, and today we're going to learn about critical points for multivariable functions. We're going to focus particularly on functions of two variables, but basically everything that we say will extend naturally to functions of three or more variables as well. All right, so think back for now, back to functions of just one variable though, okay? We already learned about critical points for one variable functions. And all a critical point was back in that setting was it was a, a point where if you plugged it into the derivative of the function, you got zero, okay? So it was a value of x for which f prime of x equals zero. Okay, and what this meant geometrically was it was a flat spot on the graph of the original function, right? It was a spot where it had a horizontal tangent line. Okay, well, a critical point for a multivariable function, it's gonna be basically the same thing. It's a spot where on the graph of that function, it's flat, it's horizontal. Okay, so how do we sort of formalize this? How do we make this sort of proper and, and talk about it mathematically? Well, for a function of two variables, a critical point, it's a pair x, y, right? It's a set of inputs for which the gradient equals zero, okay? So this time you don't just need the derivative because, well, there's a whole bunch of derivatives now, right? You have partial derivatives in the different directions. This time we need the entire gradient to equal zero. In other words, we need the x partial derivative to equal zero and the y partial derivative to equal zero, okay? And sort of geometrically what this means is it means that the, the graph of the function, it's flat, it's horizontal in the x direction, and it's also flat or horizontal in the y direction. Okay, but also very importantly, if you think about directional derivatives, remember directional derivatives, the way we computed them was in terms of the gradient, okay? Directional derivatives, every directional derivative, it was just the gradient dotted with the direction vector. Okay, well, if the gradient equals zero, then this dot product always equals zero. So in particular, if your x partial is zero and your y partial is zero, therefore your gradient is zero, therefore, every directional derivative equals zero. So it's not just flat in the x direction and the y direction, it's actually flat in every direction if it's flat in those two directions, okay? But for the purposes of computation, it suffices just to check the x and y directions, okay? You only have to check that the x partial is zero and the y partial is zero. That gets you all of the other directions for free. All right, so let's go through a quick example here to get a feeling for critical points and multivariable functions, okay? So let's start off just with this simple function, f of x, y equals x squared plus y squared. Let's find all of its critical points, okay? And the way that you do this is you just take the partial derivatives and you set them equal to zero. So the x partial derivative, derivative of x squared is two x, derivative of y squared is just zero because with respect to x, y is a constant. Okay. And similar, similarly, the y partial derivative is just 2y because x squared is a constant with respect to y and derivative of y squared is 2y with respect to y. Okay, And what we need is we need both of these partial derivatives to be zero. Okay, To get a critical point of a two variable function, you need both of the partial derivatives to be zero, not just one or the other. Okay, So we need 2x equals zero and 2y equals zero. In other words, we need both x and y to be zero. Okay, so what this tells us is that zero, zero is the only critical point, okay? That's the only pair of x, y values that make both of these equal to zero, okay? And geometrically, what's going on here is that means on the graph of this function, there's only one spot where the graph of that function is flat or horizontal. And yeah, that spot, it's right down here. If you plot this function, it looks like a bowl, okay? It's called a paraboloid, but it just looks like a bowl. And then down at the very tippy bottom of the bowl, that's where the critical point is. Okay, so this raises a very natural question. What can critical points of two variable functions look like? Okay, we just saw an example, f of x equals x squared plus y squared, where the critical point, it was the bottom of a bowl. It was a minimum, okay? So that's the first possibility. Critical points, they can be minimums, just like this, you know, paraboloid bowl example. Okay, but there are other possibilities as well. And the, the first other one that we're gonna talk about is not too surprising. It could also be a maximum. Critical points can be maximums. So for example, if we just stick a minus sign in front of the function that we were just, just working with and instead consider minus x squared minus y squared, well, all that is is that's the upside down paraboloid now. Now it's opening to the bottom rather than opening up. Okay, so this function again is gonna have a unique critical point at zero, zero, but this time that critical point, it's up at the top of the hill. Okay, so the critical point is a maximum in this case. Back in the one variable setting, those were basically the only possibilities. Critical points were maxes or mins. But in the multivariable setting, there's another possibility that results from the fact that there are lots of different directions. There are also what are called saddle points. 
okay? And these are points where the function, it increases in some directions and decreases in others, okay? So for example, the function f of x equals x times y, if you plot that, well, it's got a unique critical point at zero, zero. So again, at the origin, but if you sort of trace along in this direction, you're gonna see, oh yeah, coming away from zero, zero, it goes up like a parabola. But if you go in the perpendicular direction, you find that it goes sort of down, like an upside down parabola, okay? So it's not a max or a min, it depends on which direction you walk in. It's sort of a max in one direction, but a min in another direction. Okay, so those are called saddle points. Basically because the graph, it looks kind of like a saddle. Okay, so let's go through another example now to sort of highlight these different types of critical points. And in particular, we're gonna see that this function has a whole bunch of different critical points, okay? The previous example we went through, there was just one critical point, but now we're gonna have a whole bunch and they're gonna be of different types. Okay, so the function that we're gonna go through now is 3xy over e to the x squared plus y squared. And so the way that you find the critical points is the same as what we did before. You take the partial derivatives and you set them both equal to zero. Okay, so take its x partial derivative and you get this junk here. And if you take the y partial derivative, you get this junk here via same similar calculation. Both, both of those can be found via the quotient rule or via the product rule combined with the chain rule. Okay, so find those partial derivatives however you like. And I've done something here. I factored both of these partial derivatives as much as I can, right? I factored that numerator as much as I can and I simplified things down. You're gonna wanna do that before this next step. You wanna factor things as much as possible because now you're gonna set these both equal to zero. Okay, and setting something equal to zero, you wanna have it factored before you try to do that. Okay, so I need to set both of those equal to zero. Let's do it. I'm gonna focus on one of them at a time, okay? And then I'll combine my answers at the end. Okay, so let's start off with this partial derivative with respect to x. Let's set that equal to zero. Okay, well, the way that you set a fraction equal to zero is you just set the numerator equal to zero. Don't worry about the e to the x squared plus y squared in the denominator. That has no effect on whether or not it, the whole expression equals zero. So just forget about it. Okay, so that partial derivative equals zero if and only if the numerator equals zero. And when does that numerator equal to zero? Well, because it's factored, we know it equals zero if and only if one of the factors equals zero. So I know either three y equals zero or one minus two x squared equals zero. Okay, one of the factors has to equal zero. Okay, now I'm just gonna simplify the second part a little bit. One minus two x squared equals zero. Well, when does that equal zero? I'll just rearrange and solve for x. X is plus or minus one over root two. Okay, so those are the two possibilities. Those are the ways that the x partial derivative can equal zero, either y equals zero or x is plus or minus one over root two. Okay, and now we're just gonna do the same thing with the other partial derivative. Do the same thing with the y partial, set the numerator equal to zero. Okay, so three x times one minus two y squared equals zero. That means that, hey, at least one of those factors equals zero. So either x equals zero or one minus two y squared equals zero. And again, just solve for y in that second expression and, you, and you're gonna get y equals plus or minus one over root two again, okay? It's very similar to the expression on the left, just the roles of x and y have swapped. Okay, now be careful here with your and and or quantifiers, okay? So we need this to hold and this to hold, okay? So it's a weird combination of ands and ors. Be a little bit careful. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna go through and ask, okay, well, what happens if y equals zero? And then I need one of these to hold. And then I'm gonna go through separately, well, what, if, what happens if x equals plus or minus one over root two? And then I also need one of these to hold. Okay, so one way for both of these expressions to hold is if y equals zero, and now I jump over here, and well, x could equal zero, okay? So I get zero, zero as one of my critical points. Another possibility, I could think, okay, well, what if y equals zero and y equals plus or minus one over root two? Oh, that can't happen. I can't have y equal to two different things, okay? So that sort of splitting up of things doesn't get me a valid critical point, all right? So the next case I'm gonna consider is what if x equals plus one over root two, then, x could equal zero, oh no, no it couldn't, it can't equal two different things. Okay, so x equals plus one over root two and y equals plus one over root two, that's a thing that could happen. Okay, so that's another critical point. Or I could also have x equals plus one over root two and y equals minus one over root two, that's another critical point. Or I could do a similar thing with the negative x branch over here. I could have x is minus one over root two and y is plus, or I could have them both be negative, okay? And then I'm out of cases. There's no other ways for this expression to be true and this expression to be true. There are only those five critical points. Okay, 
Our follow-up question, once we've found the critical points, is usually, well, what types of critical points are they? Are they maxes, are they mins, or are they saddle points? Okay, and we don't have the tools to answer that problem yet. One thing that we could do is we could graph this function and just plot where the critical points are, and here they are. Okay, so zero, zero is this one in the middle, and then one over root two, one over root two is over there, um, and then minus, minus is over there, and then the ones with the mixed terms are there and there. Okay, so what that's telling us, what it looks like from the graph is we've got two maxes here and here, and it also looks like we've got two mins here and here, right? Those guys are down to bottoms of valleys. And it also looks like we've got a saddle point in the middle. It looks like zero, zero is a saddle point because if you sort of go in this direction, you're gonna increase away from zero, zero. If you go in that direction, you're gonna decrease away from zero, zero. Okay, so it looks like we've got a saddle, two maxes and two mins. But how could we prove that? How could we really sort, sort of show that mathematically? Well, that's what we're gonna do next lecture. So I will see you then.